a long time ago, in a galaxy far, far away. Star Wars Lost Tribe of the Sith Number 1 Precipice By John Jackson Miller Read by Decade Bird Publishing Chapter 1 5000 Years BBY Low Joy Give me something Scrambling to his feet in the darkness, Commander Corsin craned his neck to find the hologram. Thrusters, attitude control, I'll take parking jets. A starship is a weapon, but it's the crew that makes it deadly. An old spacer's line, trite, but weighty enough to lend a little authority. Corsin had used it himself on occasion. But not today. His ship was being deadly all on its own, and his crew was just along for the ride. We've got nothing. Commander. The serpent-haired engineer flickered before him, off-kilter and out of focus. Corsin knew things below decks must be bad if his upright, uptight Hodin genius was off-balance. Reactors are down. And we've got structural failures in the hull, both aft and... <coughs> Lojoy shrieked in agony, her tendrils bursting into a mane of fire that sent her reeling out of view. Corsin barely suppressed a startled laugh. In karma times, half a standard hour ago, he'd joked that Hodin were half-tree. But that was hardly appropriate when the whole engineering deck was going up. The hull had ruptured. Again. The hologram expired, and all around the stocky commander, warning lights danced, winked, and went out. Corsin blocked down again, clutching at the armrests. Well, the chair still works. Anything? Anybody? Silence, and the remote grinding of metal. Just give me something to shoot at. It was Gloyd, Corsin's gunnery officer, teeth shining in the shadows. The half-smirk was a memento from a Jedi lightsaber swipe years earlier that just missed taking the Hauk's head off. In response, Gloyd had cultivated the only wit aboard as acidic as the commander's own, but the gunner wasn't finding much funny today. Corsin read it in the brute's tiny eyes, one close call is all. Corsin didn't bother to look at the other side of the bridge. Icy glares there could be taken as a given. Even now, when Omen was crippled and plummeting out of control. Anybody. Even now. Corsin's bushy eyebrows flared into a black V. What was wrong with them? The adage was right. A ship needed a crew united in purpose, only the purpose of being Sith was the exaltation of self. Every ensign an emperor. Every rival's misstep, an opportunity. Well, here's an opportunity, he thought. Solve this, someone, and you can flat out have the blasted comfy chair. Sith power games. They didn't mean much now, not against the insistent gravity below. Corsin looked up again at the forward viewport. The vast Asher orb visible earlier was gone, replaced by light, gas, and grit raining upward. The latter two, he knew, came from the guts of his own ship, losing the fight against the alien atmosphere. Whatever it was, the planet had omen now. A jolt, and more screams. This wouldn't last long. Remember, he yelled, looking at them for the first time since it had started. You wanted to be here? And they had, most of them, anyway. Omen had been the ship to get when the Sith mining flotilla gathered at Primus Galud. The Masasi shock troops in the hold didn't care where they went, who knew what the Masasi even thought half the time, presuming they did at all. But many sentients who had a choice in the matter picked Omen. Saz, captain of the Harbinger, was a fallen Jedi, an unknown quantity. You couldn't trust someone the Jedi couldn't trust, and they would trust just about anyone. Yaru Korsin, the crew members knew, a Sith captain owning a smile was rare enough, and always suspect. But Corsin had been at it for twenty standard years, long enough for those who'd served under him to spread the word. A Corsin ship was an easy ride. Just not today. Fully loaded with lignin crystals, Harbinger and Omen had ready to leave Fegan III for the front when a Jedi starfighter tested the mining fleet's defenses. While the crescent-shaped blades tangled with the intruder, Corsin's crew made preparations to jump to hyperspace. Protecting the cargo was paramount, 
and if they managed to make their delivery before the Jedi turncoat made his, well, that was just a bonus. The Blade pilots could hitch back on Harbinger. Only something had gone wrong. A shock to the Harbinger, and then another. Sensor readings of the sister ship went nonsensical, and Harbinger yawed dangerously toward Omen. Before the collision warning could sound, Corsin's navigator reflexively engaged the hyperdrive. It had been in the nick of time. Or maybe not. Not the way Omen was giving up its vitals now. They did hit us, Corsin knew. The telemetry might have told them, had they had any. The ship had been knocked off course by an astronomical hair, but it was enough. Commander Corsin had never felt an encounter with a gravity well in hyperspace, and neither had any of his crew. Stories required survivors. But it felt as though space itself had yawned open near the passing omen, needing at the ship's alloyed superstructure like putty. It lasted but a fraction of a second, if time even existed there. The escape was worse than the contact. A sickly snap, and shielding failed. Bulkheads gave. And then, the armory. The armory had exploded. That was easy enough to know from the gaping hole in the underside of the ship. That it had exploded in hyperspace was a matter of inference, they were still alive. Grenades, bombs, and all the other pleasantries his secondary cargo, the Masasi, were taking to Kirik would have gone up in a theatrical flourish, taking the ship with it. But instead the armory had simply vanished, along with an impressive chunk of Omen's quarter deck. The physics in hyperspace were unpredictable by definition, instead of exploding outward, the breached deck simply left the ship in a seismic tug. Corsin could imagine the erupting munitions dropping out of hyperspace light years behind the omen, wherever it was. That would mean a bad day for someone. Oh, wait. It's already my turn. Omen had shuddered into real space, decelerating madly, and taking dead aim at a blister of blue hanging before a vibrant star. Was that the source of the mass shadow that had interrupted their trip? Who cared? It was about to end it. Captured, Omen had skipped and bounced across the crystal ocean of air until the descent began in earnest. It had claimed his engineer, probably all his engineers, but the command deck still held. To Pony craftsmanship, Corsin marveled. They were falling, but for the moment they were still alive. Why isn't he dead? Half mesmerized by the streamers of fire erupting outside, at least the omen was bellowed down for this bounce, Corsin only vaguely grew aware of harsh words to his left. You shouldn't have made the jump. Stabbed a young voice. Why isn't he dead? Commander Corsin straightened and gave his half-brother an incredulous stare. I know you're not talking to me. Devor Corsin jabbed a gloved finger past the commander to a frail man, still jabbing futilely at his control panel and looking very alone. That navigator of yours. Why isn't he dead? Maybe he's on the wrong deck? Yaru. It wasn't a joke, of course. Boyle Marcom had been guiding Sith ships through the weirdness of hyperspace since the middle of Marco Ragnos's rule. Boyle hadn't been at his best in years, but Yaru Corsin knew a former helmsman of his father's was always worth having. Not today, though. Whatever had happened back there, it would rightfully be laid at the navigator's feet. But assigning blame in the middle of a firestorm? That was Devor all over. We'll do this later, the Elder Corsin said from the command chair. If there is a later. Anger flashed in Devor's eyes. Yoru couldn't remember ever seeing anything else there. The pale and lanky Devor little resembled his own ruddy, squat frame, also the shape of their father. But those eyes, and that look? Those could have been a direct transplant. Their father. He'd never had a day like this. The old spacer had never lost a ship for the Sith Lords. Learning at his side, the teenage Yaru had staked out his own future, until the day he became less enamored of his father's footsteps. The day when Devor arrived. Half Yaru's age, son to a mother from another port on another planet, and embraced by the old admiral without a second thought. Rather than find out how many more children his father had out there to vie for stations on the bridge, Cadet Corsin appealed to the Sith Lords for another assignment. That had not been a mistake. In five years, he made captain. In ten, he won command of the newly christened Omen over a captain many years his senior. His father hadn't liked that. 
He'd never lost a ship for the Sith Lords. But he'd lost one to his son. But now, losing the Omen was looking like a family tradition. The whole bridge crew, even the outsider Devor, exhaled audibly when rivulets of moisture replaced the flames outside the viewport. Omen had found the stratosphere without incinerating, and now the ship was in a lazy saucer spin through clouds heavy with rain. Corsin's eyes narrowed. Water? Is there even a ground? The terrifying thought rippled through the minds of the seven on the bridge at once, as they watched the transparent steel viewport bulge and warp, gas giant. It took a long time to crash from orbit, presuming you survived Reentry. How much longer, if there was no surface? Corsin fumbled aimlessly for the controls set in his armrest. Omen would crack and rupture, smothered under a mountain of vapors. They shared the thought, and almost in response, the straining portal darkened. All of you, he said, heads down. And grab something, now. This time, they did as told. He knew, tie it to self-preservation, and a Sith would do anything. Even this bunch. Corsin clawed at the chair, his eyes fixed on the forward viewport and the shadow swiftly falling across it. A wet mass slapped against the hull. Its spindly form tumbled across the transparent steel, lingering an instant before disappearing. The commander blinked twice. It was there and gone, but it wasn't part of his ship. It had wings. Startled, Corsin sprang from his seat and lurched toward the viewport. This time, the mistake was certifiably his. Already stressed before the mid-air collision, the transparent steel gave way, shards weeping from the ship like shining tears. A hush of departing air slammed course into the deck plating. Old Markon tumbled to one side, having lost hold of his station. Sirens sounded, how were they still working, but the tumult soon subsided. Without thinking, Corsin breathed. Air. It's air. Devor regained his footing first, bracing against the wind. Their first luck. The viewport had mostly blown out, not in, and while the cabin had lost pressure, a drippy, salty wind was slowly replacing it. Unaided, Commander Corsin fought his way back to his station. Thanks for the hand, brother. Just a reprieve. Gloyd said. They still couldn't see what was below. Corsin had done a suicide plunge before, but that had been in a bomber, when he'd known where the ground was. That there was a ground. Once restrained doubts flooded Corsin's mind, and Devor responded. Enough. The crystal hunter barked, struggling against the swaying deck to reach his sibling's command chair. Let me at those controls. They are as dead for you as they are for me. We'll see about that. Devor reached for the armrest, only to be blocked by Corsin's beefy wrist. The commander's teeth clenched. Don't do this. Not now. A baby screamed. Corsin looked quizzically at Devor for a moment before turning to see Sealer in the doorway, clutching a small crimson-wrapped bundle. The child wailed. Darker skinned than either of them, Sealer was an operative on Devor's mining team. Corsin knew her simply as Devor's female, that was the nicest way to put it. He didn't know which role came first. Now the willowy figure looked haggard as she slumped against the doorway. Her child, bound tightly in the manner of their people, had worked a tiny arm free and was clawing at her scattered auburn hair. She seemed not to notice. Surprise, was it annoyance, crossed Devor's face. I sent you to the life pods. Corsin flinched. The life pods were a non-starter, literally. They'd known that back in space when the first one snagged on its stubborn docking claw and exploded right in the ship's hull. He didn't know what had happened to the rest, but the ship had taken such damage to its spine that he figured the whole array was a probable loss. The cargo hold. She said, gasping as Devor reached her and grasped her arms. Near our quarters. Devor's eyes darted past her, down the hallway. Devor, you can't go to the life pods. Shut up, Yaru. Stop it. She said. There's land. When Devor stared at her blankly, she exhaled and looked urgently toward the commander. Land. Corsin made the connection. The cargo hold. 
the crystals were in a hole safely forward from the damage, in a place with viewports angled to see below. There was something under all that blue, after all. Something that gave them a chance. The port thruster will light. She implored. No, it won't, Corsin said. Not from any command on the bridge, anyway. We're going to have to do this by hand, so to speak. He stepped past the ailing mark onto the starboard viewport, which looked back upon the main bulge of the ship trailing aft. There were four large torpedo tube covers on either side of the ship, spherical lids that swiveled above or below the horizontal plane depending on where they were situated. They never opened those covers in atmospheres, for fear of the drag they would cause. That design flaw might save them. Lloyd, will they work? They'll cycle, once. But without power, we're gonna have to set off the firing pins to open them. Devor gawked. We're not going out there. They were still at terminal velocity. But Corsin was moving, too, bustling past his brother to the port viewport. Everyone, to either side. Sela and another crewman stepped to the right pane. Devor, glaring, reluctantly joined her. Alone on the left, Yaru Corsin placed his hand on the coldly sweating portal. Outside, meters away, he found one of the massive circular covers, and a small box mounted to its side, no larger than a comlink. It was smaller than he remembered from inspection. Where's the mechanism? There. He reached out through the force. Careful. Top torpedo door, both sides. Now. With a determined mental act, Corsin triggered the firing pin. A large bolt released explosively, shooting ahead, and the mammoth tube cover moved in response, rotating on its single hinge. The ship, already quaking, groaned loudly as the door reached its final position, perched atop the plane of the omen like a makeshift aileron. Corsin looked expectantly behind him, where Sela's expression assured him of a similar success on her side. For a moment, he wondered if it had worked. With a wrenching jolt that leveled the bridge crew, Omen tipped downward. It didn't slow the ship as much as Corsin had expected, but that wasn't the point. At least they could see where they were going now, what was below. If these blasted clouds would clear. At once, he saw it. Land, indeed, but more water. Much more. Jagged, rugged peaks rose from a greenish surf, almost a skeleton of rock lit by the alien planet's setting sun, barely visible on the horizon. They were rocketing quickly into night. There wouldn't be much time to make a decision. But Corsin already knew there was no choice to be made. While more of the crew might survive a water landing, they wouldn't last long when their superiors learned their precious cargo was at the bottom of an alien ocean. Better they pick the crystals out from among our burned corpses. Frowning, he ordered the starboard side crew to activate their lower torpedo doors. Again, a violent lurch, an omen banked left, angling toward an angry line of mountains. Rearward, a life pod shot away from the ship, and slammed straight into the ridge. The searing bloom was gone from the bridge's field of view in less than a second. Gloyd's torpedo crew would be envious, Corsin thought, shaking his head and blowing out a big breath. Still people alive back there. They are still trying. Omen cleared a snow-covered peak by less than a hundred meters. Dark water opened up below. Another course correction, an omen was quickly running out of torpedo tubes. Another life pod launched, arcing down and away. Only when the small craft neared the surf did its pilot, if it had won, get the engine going. The rocket shot the pod straight down into the ocean at full speed. Squinting through sweat, Corson looked back at his crew. Depth charge. Fine time for a mixed warfare drill. Even Gloyd didn't laugh at that one. But it wasn't propriety, the commander saw as he turned. It was what was ahead. More sharp mountains rising from the waters, including a mountain meant for them. Corson reeled back to his chair. Stations. Sela wandered in a panic, nearly losing the wailing Jariad as she staggered. She had no station, no defensive position. She began to cross to Devor, frozen at his terminal. There was no time. A hand reached for her. Yaru yanked her close, pushing her down behind the command chair into a protective crouch. The act cost him. 
Omen slammed into a granite ridge at an angle, losing the fight, and still more of itself. The impact threw Commander Corsin forward against the bulkhead, nearly impaling him on the remaining shards of the smashed viewport. Gloyd and Markon strained to move toward him, but Omen was still on the move, clipping another rocky rise and spiraling downward. Something exploded, strewing flaming wreckage in the ship's grinding wake. Agonizingly, Omen spun forward again, the torpedo doors that had been their makeshift air brake snapping like driftwood as it slid. Down a gravelly incline it skidded, showering stones in all directions. Corsin, his forehead bleeding, looked up and out to sea. Nothing. Omen continued to slide toward an abyss. It had run out of mountain. Stop. 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 Silence. Corsin coughed and opened his eyes. They were still alive. No. Sila said, kneeling and clinging to Jariad. We're already dead. Thanks to you, she did not say, but Corsin felt the words streaming at him through the force. He didn't need the help. Her eyes said plenty. Chapter 2 Omen's permanent crew came from the same human stock as Corsin, the debris of a noble house, launched skyward centuries before in the whirlwind that formed the Taponi Empire. The Sith had found them, and found them useful. They were skilled in commerce and industry, all the things the Sith Lords needed most but never had time for with their world-building and world-destroying. His ancestors ran ships and factories, and ran them well. And before long, mingling their blood with that of the Dark Jedi, the Force was in his people, too. They were the future. They couldn't acknowledge it, but it was obvious. Many of the Sith Lords were still of the crimson-hued species that had long formed the nucleus of their following. But the numbers were turning, and if Naga Sado wanted to rule the galaxy, they had to. Naga Sado. Tentacle-faced, Dark Lord and heir to ancient powers. It was Naga Sado who had dispatched Omen and Harbinger in search of lignan crystals, Naga Sado who needed the crystals on Kirek to defeat the Republic and its Jedi. Or was it the Jedi and their Republic? It didn't matter. Naga Sado would kill Commander Corsin and his crew for losing their ship. Sela was right about that much. Yet Sado need not lose the war, depending on what Corsin did now. He still had something. The crystals. But the crystals were high above at the moment. It had been a night of horrors, getting 355 people down from the lofty plateau. 16 injured had died along the way, and another 5 had tumbled into the darkness from the narrow ledge that formed the only apparent way up or down. No one doubted that evacuation had been the right call, though. They couldn't stay up there, not with the fire still burning and the ship precariously perched. The last to leave the ship, Corsin had nearly soiled himself when one of the proton torpedoes had disengaged from the naked tube, tumbling over the precipice and into oblivion. By sunrise, they'd found a clearing, halfway down the mountain, dotted with wild grasses. Life was everywhere in the galaxy, even here. It was the first good sign. Above, Omen continued to burn. No need to wonder where above them the ship was, Corsin thought. Not while they could follow the smoke. Now, walking back into the afternoon crowd, less an encampment than a gathering, Corsin knew he never need wonder where his people were, either. Not while his nose worked. Now I know why we kept the Masasi on their own level, he said to no one. Charming. Came a response from over his shoulder. I should say they are not very happy with you, either. Ravelin was a red Sith, pure-blooded as they came. He was quartermaster and keeper of the Masasi, the nasty lumbering bipeds that the Sith prized as instruments of terror on the battlefield. At the moment the Masasi didn't seem so formidable. Corson followed Ravelin into the fiendish circle, made even less pleasant by the stench of vomit. Florid monsters two and three meters tall sprawled on the ground, heaving and coughing. Maybe some kind of pulmonary edema. Sela said, passing around purified air canisters salvaged from an emergency pack. Before connecting with Devor and securing a place on his team, she'd been a battlefield medic, though Corsin couldn't tell from her bedside manner, at least with Masasi. She barely touched the wheezing giant. We're no longer at elevation, so this should subside. Probably normal. 
To her left, another Masasi hacked mightily and neatly regarded the result, a handful of dripping scar tissue. Corson looked at the quartermaster and asked dryly, Is that normal? You know it's not. Ravelin snarled. From across the clearing, Devor Corson charged in, shoving his son into Celia's hands before she was done wiping them. He seized the brute's massive wrist, looking for himself. His eyes flared at his brother. But Masasi are tougher than anything. Anything they can punch, kick, or strangle, Corson said. An alien planet, however, was an alien planet. They hadn't had time to do a bioscan. And all the equipment was high above. Devor followed Sela, backing away from the sickly Masasi. Eighty of the creatures had survived the crash. Corson learned that Ravalent assistants were burning a third of those survivors, even then, over the hillside. Whatever unseen thing it was on this planet that was killing the Masasi, it was doing it quickly. Ravelin showed him the stinking pyre. They are not far enough away, Corsin said. From whom? Ravelin responded. Is that depression a permanent camp? Should we remove to a different mountain? Enough, Rav. No witty comeback. I'm surprised. You at least plan that far ahead. Corsin had fenced with Ravelin on earlier missions, but now wasn't the time. I said, enough. We've surveyed below. You saw it. There's nowhere to go. There were beaches at the bottom of the bluff, but they terminated against the oily cliffs that began the next mountain in the chain. And going farther along the chain meant trips through tangles of razor-sharp brambles. We don't need an expedition. We're not staying. I should hope not. Ravelin said, his own nose turned by the smell of the fires. But your brother, I mean, Captain Corsin's other son, feels we shouldn't wait to return. Yaru Corsin stopped. I have the transmitter codes. It's my call to make. He looked up at the second, more distant smoky plume far above. When it's safe. Yes, by all means. When it's safe. The commander hadn't wanted Devor on the mission. Years earlier, he had been relieved when his half-brother had abandoned a naval career, drifting into the Sith's mineralogical service. Power and riches were more easily had there, searching for gems and force-imbued crystals. With their father's sponsorship, Devor had become a specialist in using plasma weapons and scanning equipment. The recent conflict with the Jedi found him in high demand, and assigned, with his team, to Omen. Corsin wondered whom he'd played a joke on to deserve that. He'd been told Devor officially answered to him, but that would have been a first. Not even Sith Lords were that powerful. You should have kept us in orbit. We were never in orbit. Corson recognized the voice of the navigator, Markom, coming from over the dusty rise. He already knew the other one. The old man was trying to push his way out of the crowd when Corson topped the hill at a full run. Devor's miners weren't letting Boyle go. You don't know my job. He yelled. I did all that I could. Oh, what's the use talking to? Just as Corsin reached the clearing, the crowd surged forward, as if pulled down a drain. One sickeningly familiar crackle followed another. No. Corsin saw the lightsaber first, rolling toward his feet when he breached the crowd. His father's old helmsman lay ahead, gutted. Next to Sela and Jariad stood Devor, his lightsaber glowing crimson in the lengthening shadows. The navigator attacked first. Sela said. The commander gawked. What difference does it make? Corsin charged into the center, lifting the loose lightsaber into his hand with the force. Devor stood his ground, smiling gently and keeping his lightsaber burning. His dark eyes had a wild look, a familiar one. He was shaking a little, but not from fear, not fear Yaru Corsin could feel. The commander knew it was something else, something more dangerous. He turned Markham's unlit weapon tip down and shook it. That was our navigator, Devor. What if the star charts don't work? I can find our way back. Devor said smartly. You'll have to. Corsin grew conscious of the mix around him. Gold uniformed miners in the circle, yes, but bridge crew, too. A red-faced Sith, not Ravelin, but one of his cronies. 
he was undeterred. This is not going to do any good, any of you. We wait here until it's safe to return to the ship. That's all. Sela straightened, emboldened by the supporters around. When will it be safe? In days? Weeks? Her child wailed. How long must we last, until it's safe enough for you? Corsin stared at her and breathed deeply. He threw Markham's lightsaber to the ground. Tell Ravelin there's one more for the pyre. As a begrudging crowd gave him room to exit, he said, we go when I say. That ship blows up or tips into the ocean and we really will have problems. We go when I say. The world spun. As Corsin stepped backward, Gloyd stepped forward, keeping a wary yellow eye on the grumbling masses. He'd missed the fun. Commander. They looked past each other, watching Sith in all directions. Not really happy here, Gloyd. Then you'll want to hear this. The hulking Hauk rasped. As I see it, we've got three choices. We get these people off this rock in whatever will fly. Or we look for cover and hide until they all kill one another. What's the third choice? Gloyd's painted face crinkled. There isn't one. But I figured it'd cheer you up if you thought there was. I hate you. Great. You'll make someone a fine Sith someday. Corsin had known Gloyd since his first command. The Hauk was the kind of bridge officer every Sith captain wanted, more interested in his own job than in taking someone else's. Gloyd was smart to spare himself the trouble. Or maybe he just loved blowing things up too much to want to leave the tactical station. Of course, with that station left roughly a kilometer up the mountain, Corsin had no idea how useful his old ally would be. But Gloyd still had 50 kilos on most of the crew. No one would move against them while they stood together. No one would move alone, anyway. Corsin looked back across the clearing at the mob. Ravelin was there now, huddled with Devor and Sela and a couple of junior officers. Devor spotted his brother watching and averted his gaze, Sela simply stared back at the commander, unabashed. Corsin spat an epithet. Gloyd, we're dying here. I don't understand them. Yeah, you do. Gloyd said. You know what we say, you and me, we're about the job. Other Sith are about what's next. The Hauk plucked a scaly root from the ground and sniffed it. Trouble is, this whole place is about what's next. You're trying to keep them together, when you've really got to show them there's something after this rock. There's no time to win people over. You pick a path. Anybody won't walk it. Push them off? Corsin grinned. It really wasn't his style. Gloyd returned the smile and sank his teeth into the root. Wincing comically, the gunnery chief excused himself. They wouldn't be living off the land, not this land, anyway. Looking back at the teeming crowd, Corsin found his eyes drifting up toward the dwindling tendril of smoke drifting from the heights above. Above. Gloyd was right. It was the only way. Chapter 3 The Masasi had died on the mountain. Corsin had left at dawn with three bearers, the healthiest of the Masasi, each passing around the remaining air canister. It hadn't lasted, and neither had they. Whatever it was on this planet that didn't like Masasi existed up above as well as below. It was just as well, Corsin thought, leaving the blood-colored corpses where they fell. He couldn't run Masasi. They were pliant and obedient warriors, but they answered to force, not words. A good Sith captain needed to use both, but Corsin leaned more on the latter. It had made for a good career. Not down the mountain, though. Things were going to get worse. They already had. It had been cold in the night, chillier than he had expected from what seemed like an oceanic climate. Some of the heavily injured had failed from exposure or from lack of medical care. Later, some kind of animal, Gloyd described it to him as a six-legged mammal, half-mouth, vaulted from a burrow and tore into one of the injured. It took five exhausted sentries to slay the beast. One of Devor's mining specialists cast a chunk of the creature's body into the campfire and sampled a piece. She vomited blood and died within heartbeats. He was glad he hadn't been awake for that. 
whatever relief there was in knowing there was life on the planet ended right there. Omen's crew didn't number enough to sort out what was safe and what wasn't. They had to go home, regardless of the state of things with the ship. Corsin looked up into the morning sky, now streaked more by cirrus clouds than smoke. He hadn't told the others about the thing that had struck the viewport during the descent. What had he seen? Another predator, probably. There was no point in bringing it up. Everyone was scared enough, and fear led to anger. The Sith understood this, they made use of it, but uncontrolled, it wasn't doing them any good. The sun hadn't even set before lightsabers came out again in a dispute over a food pack. One less red Sith. Not 20 standard hours since the crash and things were starting to get basic. Tribal. Time had run out. Omen had come to rest in a small indentation down a short ways on the other side of a crest. Sky and ocean spread out ahead. The ship had stopped on the incline just in time, and there wasn't a flat plane left on the vehicle. The sight of his ship, shattered on the alien rocks, moved Corsin only a little. He had known opponents, mainly captains in the Republic, who were sentimental about their commands. It wasn't the Sith way. Omen was a tool like any other, a blaster or lightsaber, to be used and discarded. And while the ship's resilience had saved his life, it had betrayed him first. Not a thing to be forgiven. Still, it had a purpose. Flying again was out of the question, but the sight of the metal tower just above the bridge gave him hope. The receiver would find the Republic's hyperspace beacons in an instant, telling Corsin his location. And the ship's transmitter would tell the Sith where to find Omen, and, more important, the Lignan. Maybe not in time for the engagement at Kirik, but Sado would want it nonetheless. Walking carefully over loose stones to the airlock, Corsin tried not to think of the other possibility. If the Battle of Kirik was lost because Omen was lost, he would die. But he would die having completed his mission. A vial lay empty in Devor's open, quaking palm. Devor had somehow gotten to Omen first, and was sitting in the commander's chair. Well, slouching was more like it. I see your cabins intact, Corsin said. He remembered Sela returning to the living quarters for little Jariad. In a fire, you go for the thing you love. I didn't go there first. Devor said, limply letting the vial drop to the deck beside the command chair. There was another container there, particles of glistening spice still beside it. He's been here a while, Corsin guessed. He had a sneaking suspicion spice was why Devor had gone into mining in the first place, it had certainly shortened his naval career. I didn't go there, I mean, it wasn't first. Devor said, pointing vaguely to the ceiling. I went to look at the transmitter array. Structure looked sound. From outside, maybe. Slouched in the command chair, Devor watched blankly as his brother clambered over fallen beams to reach the ladder. Above the ceiling panels, Corsin saw what Devor must have seen, a melted mass of electronics, fried when a seam opened in the hull during the descent. The external transmitter stood, all right, but as a monument to its former purpose, nothing more. Climbing down, Corsin made his way to the comm control panel and pressed the button several times. Nothing. He sighed. The story was the same everywhere on the bridge. He switched the transmitter on one last time and stepped back over the debris. Omen was dead. But Sith had survived death before, and the guts of Omen still held enough spare parts to allow a transplant. His eyes darted to the hallway. Surely, in the workshop. Gone, with the armory. The explosion had vented most of the stores into space. Devor buried his face in his hands, finished. Corson wasn't. The landing bay. The blades. The fighters had been in flight when Omen made its sudden departure, but something in the landing bay might be serviceable. Forget it, Yaru. The deck was crushed when we hit. I couldn't even get in there. Then we will cut the ship down deck by deck and fabricate the parts we need. With what? Our lightsabers? Devor rose, steadying himself against the armrest. We're done. His cough became a laugh. The lignin crystals offered the Sith power, just not the kind to operate a distress beacon, a receiver, or even the celestial atlas. We are here, Yaru. We are here and we are out of action. 
out of the war, out of everything. We are out of it. You're out of it. Corson climbed into a hallway and began rummaging through cabinets, looking for something that would help those below. Unfortunately, Omen had been outfitted for a deep space mission. Sith provisioners were sparing. No portable generators at all. Another compartment. Clothes. That would help tonight, but they wouldn't be staying. We have to stay. Devore said, as if he had read Corsin's thought. What? We have to stay. Devore repeated. Standing alone, tombstone in the shadows of the hallway, he spoke with a voice that quaked. It's been two days. You don't understand. It's been two days. Corsin didn't stop his search, passing in front of his brother to another door, jammed by the damage. It's been two days. Yaru. Naga Sada will think we ran away. To take the lignin crystals for ourselves. He'll blame Saz, Corsin said, remembering. Naga Sada hadn't fully trusted the fallen Jedi who captained the Harbinger. He'd asked Corsin to keep an eye on Saz, to report back. When he did, if he did, Corsin fully intended to explain how the Harbinger had lost control, how the Harbinger had struck the Omen. With any luck, Sado had Harbinger already. Corsin released the door handle. He hadn't seen what happened to Harbinger after the collision, but it was a safe bet that Sado would have the crippled Harbinger already. And Saz, sitting there with only half the shipment of lignin crystals and unable to deliver, would be bargaining for his life, saying anything about the omen. He would sing harmonies the kill would be proud of. Corson looked down the hallway. Back at Primus Galud. On the station. You met with Sado, didn't you? Devor shuffled. To discuss the lignin operation. You weren't discussing something else? Like who should command this mission? Devor glared at him with bloodshot eyes. That look again. You were discussing who should command this mission, Corsin pressed, surprised at his own calm. What did you say when he said no? The commander's blood froze. He knew how things always went with Devor, how things must have gone. Sado had rejected his half-brother, and Devor had said something. What? Not enough to offend Sado, no, Devor was still here in the wreck, drawing Labord breaths. But Sado would have reason to suspect Devor's loyalty would have caused to wonder whether his crystals were safe. The one thing Yaru Korsin had was his reputation for playing it straight, but now at a minimum, Sado would know that Korsin was not the absolute master of his own vessel. And if he wasn't? Devor's hand shook, and his lightsaber flew into it. The weapon that had killed Boyle Markom ignited in his hand. What did I tell you? Corsin yelled, approaching him anyway. No games on my ship. Shaken, Devor darted back toward the bridge. Corsin followed. The only way we come out of this is if we're completely clean, Devor. Sado can't think we did this on purpose. He reached the doorway. No games on my ship. Corsin walked into a hurricane. Devor stood atop the command chair calling forth all the debris of the bridge like a deity on a mountaintop. Corson rolled, fragments of transparent steel raking his face and ripping into his uniform. Reaching Gloyd Station, he mounted his own defense, cocooning himself in the force against the onslaught. Devor was as strong as any in his family, and now he was riding chemicals Corson didn't understand. A beam slammed against the bulkhead, and Omen shivered. A second strike, and the bridge tipped forward, knocking Devor off his perch. Corsin didn't let him get up again. The moment Devor's head appeared behind the chair, Corsin force flung him out through the ruined viewport. He had to get this outside, before everything was lost. Corsin bolted uphill through the hallway to the airlock, puffing as he did. Fighting a spice-crazed assailant on a teetering death trap? I must be the crazy one. The step down from the portal was now a leap. His boot sank into a soft patch as he hit, wrenching his ankle and sending him tumbling down the scree-covered slope. Biting his lip, he tried to clamber back from the brink toward Omen's crushed nose. A shadow was falling on him. 
He lit his lightsaber. Suddenly he saw it, or it saw him. Another winged creature, high over the near ridge, circling and watching. Watching him. Corson blinked sand from his eyes as the creature soared away. It was the same as the one from the descent, almost. The difference was... Corson felt himself lifted into the air and before he could register what was happening, he slammed into the wreck of Omen. Duvall marched into view, pebbles rolling before him as if propelled by a magnet. Trapped against the crumpled frame, Corson struggled to stand. His father's familiar look was gone from Duvall's face, replaced by a bleak nothingness. It's over, Yaru. Duvall said, raising his lightsaber high. We should have done this before. It's been decided. I'm Commander Corsin. It's been decided? The thought flashed through Yaru Corsin's mind even as the lightsaber flashed past his ear. It sparked against the omen's battered armor. The commander raised his weapon to parry the next stroke, and the next, and the next. Devore hammered away. No style, just fury. Corsin found nowhere to go, except along the side of the ship, sliding backward toward the portside torpedo tubes. Three of the doors had been opened in the descent. The fourth. Corsin spotted the control box, just like the one he'd remotely manipulated in the descent. He flexed toward it through the force, and ducked. The firing pin activated, bulleting forward and catching Devore in the lightsaber shoulder. The torpedo door tried to cycle open, but pinned against the ground it only dug into the strata, sending a stream of rocks flooding beneath the ship. Omen lurched forward again, with Devore sliding in front of it toward the edge and the ocean below. It took a minute for Corsin to get loose from the handhold he'd found on the ship, and another for the dust to clear. Finding Omen surprisingly still, he gingerly stepped away on the crushed slate. Omen's bow had impaled itself on a razor rise on the promontory, just meters from the edge. Ahead of it, partially buried in rubble, lay his brother. His golden uniform shredded, his shoulder blooded, Devore writhed on the precipice. He tried to kneel, shrugging off the surrounding rocks, only to collapse again. Devore still gripped his lightsaber. How he could still be holding onto it with the whole world falling down, Corsin didn't know. The commander fastened his own lightsaber to his belt. Yaru? Devore said. It was a whimper now. Yaru, I can't see. His face was tear-stained, but intact. Then his lightsaber rolled free, plummeting out of sight over the cliff's edge and revealing the oily pink stain on his hand. Red rage. That was what had been in the vials, Corsin thought. That was what had given Devore his manic power, and that was what was stealing from him now. The shoulder wound wasn't bad, Corsin saw, lifting his brother to his feet. Devore was young, with Seal attending to him, he might even survive out here, presuming he could live without the spice. But, what then? What could be said that wasn't already said? It's been decided. A helpful hold became a tighter grip, and Yaru Corsin turned his brother to face the setting sun over the ocean. I will complete my mission, he said, looking over the side to the ocean yawning far below. And I will protect my crew. He let go. Chapter 4 It was nearly night when Corsin appeared on the twice-trodden trail, pulling a makeshift sledge crafted from a mess table. With thermal blankets and the remaining food packs heaped upon it, Corsin had needed the help of the force a few times to get it down the mountain. Straps from pouches cut into his shoulders and neck, leaving ugly welts. The single campfire had become several. He was glad to see them. Ravelin appeared glad to see him, too, after an initial surprised reaction. The beacon. Is it working? I pushed the button myself, Corsin announced. And? And we wait. Ravelin's eyes narrowed in the smoky haze. You know where we are. You spoke to someone? Corsin's attention had already turned to unloading the packs to anxious crew members. Ravelin lowered his voice. Where are your Masasi? Corsin didn't look up. All dead. You don't think I wanted to do this myself, do you? The quartermaster's crimson face paled a little. No, of course not, Commander. 
he looked back at the summit, fading in the surrounding darkness. Perhaps others of us could have a look at the transmitter. We might. Ravelin, if you want to go back up there, you're welcome to. But I'd bring a team with some heavy equipment, because if we don't get some supports under that ship, the next person who boards could take it on its last flight. Corson set down the last pack and stretched his neck. Where are your Masasi? Ravilan stared. All dead. Corson stepped free, at last, from the cabling he'd used to drag the sledge. The bonfire blazed invitingly. So why was he so cold? Sila. Where's Devor? He looked at her coldly. Sila stood, her tarnished gold uniform flickering in the firelight. Where is Devor? He repeated. He went up. She stopped herself. No one was supposed to leave camp. And now, the look in Yaru Corsin's eyes. She squeezed Jariad, who woke crying. <coughs> the pep talk began as many of Corsin's did, with a summation of things everyone already knows. But this speech was different, because there were so many things nobody knew, himself included. The assurance that Naga Sado still valued their cargo rang true for all, and while they were clearly a long way from anywhere, few could imagine the Sith Lord's desire exceeding his reach. Even if they were less sanguine about what Sado felt about them, Corsin knew his crew would accept that someone, somewhere, was looking for them. They just didn't need to know how long that might take. It was too soon for that. Sado, he would figure out later. This place couldn't be about what was next. It had to be about now. By the speech's end, Corsin found himself growing unusually philosophical. It was our destiny to land on this rock, and we are bound to our destiny. For a time, it looks like, we're also bound to this rock, he said. So be it. We're Sith. Let's make it ours. He looked toward a satellite campfire and spotted Gloyd and the remains of his gunnery crew bristling against the breeze. He waved them to the main bonfire. It would be another hard night, Corsin knew, and the supplies he'd brought would soon run out. But he knew something else. Something he'd seen, that no one else had. The winged beast had carried a rider. The force was with them. Gripping her son, Sela watched the circle break. Nodding, human Sith set to their tasks, stepping around Ravelin, the master without Masasi. He stood aloof, commiserating with the red Sith and the few other surviving aliens. Energized and triumphant, Yaru Korsin conferred with Gloyd, keeping his confidences, as he always had, to the huge alien. Too strong to be defeated, too stupid to betray him, and dumb to the force. The perfect ally. Turning away from the Hauk, Korsin saw Sela. A new land to be broken to his will, and no one to stand in his way. He smiled. Sela returned his gaze coldly. Thinking of Devor, thinking of little Jariad, she made a quick decision. Summoning all her anger, all her hatred, all her will. Sela smiled back. Devor had underestimated Yaru Korsin. Whatever came, Sela thought, she would not. She would bite her time. Time, they had. <laughs>